Good evening. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Um, one quick announcement is that, I'm not sure if everybody knows, but Keith Grimes underwent open heart surgery a week ago yesterday and is doing well and back at home, apparently on Facebook and recuperating famously. Um, so, in his stead, Candy Palmer from the Title is on the question, officer? Uh, yeah, that works. <laughs> we'll be filling in to see. So, we live here. Oh, um, for this evening, uh, members, commissioners, like myself, Ben Covert, and the final letter of secretary, Carolyn Sheehan, and the final letter of secretary, and Brian D. Lee, who is our first ever guest. Is there a motion on the wonderfully recorded minutes? Now, what? Wonderfully recorded. I would make a motion to approve the wonderfully recorded minutes. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I think the rest is yours for a while. Sure. Uh, okay, we're going to jump right down to administrative review. Okay, uh, item number 5D1 Prospect Place, Prospect Place East. I believe the two applicants are here to uh, speak on their own behalf. Once they make their presentation, I'll fill in the goals. Uh, my name is Ralph Sylvester, for being the Haven, representing Prospect East LLC. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to, to share your request. Um, the Prospect Place. Oh, I'm sorry. The Prospect Place um, complex uh, was begun many years ago. Um, it had sort of a, a initial phase, um, and then the last remaining ooh, that's much better. Uh, the last remaining units were left unbuilt. That first initial phase um, that developer never put in um, a section of sidewalk that is marked in blue on the on the plan that you were given um, that connected from uh, Mechanic Street to the internal of the complex. The next phase in which we took over um, had a section of sidewalk marked yellow that then attempts to connect the internal of the complex to Mechanic Street. Um, unfortunately, the actual topography of the complex itself, mixed with having uh, the already existing retaining wall along Mechanic Street, as well as pretty sizable uh, floodgates and the riprap in the back there, uh, doesn't really lend to this plan actually being um, executed uh, with a, a nice neighborhood feel to it. Um, for these reasons, we are looking to uh, uh, be allowed to not put these internal sidewalks in um, and maintain the green space for the complex. Any questions? How do the, how do the occupants of the complex feel about that? Uh, they actually uh, are in favor of it. Um, the first initial portion has very well grown, uh, I should say very mature um, trees that were placed, that literally planted in place of the sidewalk. Um, and the occupants actually really like the screening um, for the internal complex from the people below to um, those above. Um, for sure, that's kind of the second floor windows um, right there. Um, and kind of as it meanders through and connects, it's just, it's very, it, it's not a nice, um, sort of topography to have a walkway um, in that section. Um, so they seem to be in favor. We haven't heard anything to the, uh, the contrary. And you don't have a lot of people walking in the road? Uh, there is there is a section of sidewalk that goes around the complex. Okay. Connects to Mechanic Street. Um, but again, like I said, this is really internally in their own, their own complex, of essentially their own driveways um, and, and kind of parking. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Do you, uh, you know what the actual grade would be if the lot? I, I looked at the topography plan. It's a very small scale in our review memo. But sure. Did anybody actually calculate what the slope of the walk would be if they were built? Um, I have not gone to that that it is that extent. Um, we'll say that the, the path as shown sort of goes directly to Mechanic Street, and it would be far too steep to to be you know, to be allowed. Um, so there would definitely have to be some sort of meandering around of that. Um, even at that extent, 
Um, it just seems to be something that is, it really would be very forced to be there, um, especially when talking about weather conditions, ice, and things like that. Um, so, but yeah, that, shots are five percent. Um, mm-hmm. I would, I would, yeah, yeah, I would definitely think so. Okay, it yeah. appears to be well in excess of five percent. Correct. Yes, and five percent is mm-hmm. is pretty much a standard on in terms of what's reasonable. Yeah, uh, particularly to deal with the climate policy. Mm-hmm. Thank you. That's helpful. Sure. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to thank you for the pictures. Mm-hmm. Really helpful. Oh, you're very welcome. Mm-hmm. Can I hear a motion? We, move, we approve the uh, removal of internal locks uh, pursuant to the request and as articulated in the request. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. Fifty-four minutes. <laughs> Next up will be item number twenty-one two four nine, zoning permit for the Stonington Country Club. They are requesting an application to construct a twelve by twelve and a half foot restroom facility on the uh, golf course, pretty much located in the north forty. In this case, the south. Oh, pardon me. It's really the south forty on this particular. Uh, uh, Pete Garden uh, with the Sergeant Country Club. Uh, club's been around for over 30 years now, and probably the students have put a real bath on the course as opposed to the outhouses that are out there. And we've chosen a spot in the southeast corner of the property. It'll serve a couple, be easy to access from a couple of the holes. And uh, 12 by 12 building, uh, three stalls, two for the ladies, one for the guys. And uh, we've got approval from the Lakeside Health District. Uh, not within 100 feet of wetlands, we've got anything we're proposing, and uh, we're hoping we can approve it tonight so we can move forward. Any questions? Just located in a flood zone by any chance. Again, I'm trying to look at the site plan. It's really uh, the reproduction is not clear. I've got it. Yeah, I can tell you quick. It's its own separate leach field? Yes. Nice, nice little building. Public public water out there or well water? Well water. Well water. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank, Thank you very much. Good night, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, next on the agenda is uh, the Mark Dental application, but I don't. Do it. Oh, you are here. Okay. Uh, is Rusty coming? Okay. Item number PZ2125, Special Use Permit and CAM for Mark J. Densmore Living Trust. Special Use Permit and Coastal Area Management Review Applications for Demolition of a One-Story Retail Building and Construction of a 44 and a half by 30-foot Two-Story Mixed-Use Structure with Office of Retail on the First Floor in One Apartment on the Second. Property located at 26 Old Stonington Road, Stonington, Assessor's Map 153, Block 2, Lot 3, Zone GC60. Um, just a quick you know, you had approved this uh, uh, structure that was just about twice the size, and that's that report from uh, the applicant was uh, copy and paste for this. So every t- place where you see two two apartments on the second floor, it really should say one apartment on the second floor. Excuse me, Candy. Was there one more old business item on our agenda? Oh, I'm sorry. This um. <laughs> tabling recommended on that one. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Make a motion to take the Second. Okay. <laughs> All those in favor? Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. All right. Now we can open this So. Okay. 
Okay, pursuant to general statutes of the State of Connecticut Revision of 1958, all amendments thereto, and pursuant to the zoning regulations of the town of Stonington, Connecticut, the Planning and Zoning Commission hereby gives notice that it will hold a public hearing at the Stonington Board of Education District Office, 40 Field Street, Pocatuck, Connecticut, on Tuesday, October 19, 2021, at 7 p.m. And as has been stated, the first application is PD 2125. Uh, UP and CAM, Mark Bensmore, Living Trust, Special Use Permanent and Coastal Area Management Review Applications for the demolition of a one story retail building and construction of a 44.5 and 30 foot two story mixed use structure with office retail on the first floor and an apartment on the second. Property located at 26 Old Stonington Road, Stonington, Assessor's Map 153, Block 2, Lot 3, Zone. Thank you, William. Um, so, seated this evening will be Chuck Ian, Fred Dykman, myself, Ben Kerwood, Wayne Conway, and Ryan Beasley. Is there a sign up sheet in the, it's at the front of the sign up? In front of the room, there's a sign up sheet if anybody wants to speak in favor or against for general comments. But the process will be the applicant will go first, then all those in favor, then those opposed, general comments, the rebuttal by the applicant. And then the staff report, discussion following, closing of the hearing, and then our vote. Good timing, Leslie. Yeah. You need time to set up, Rusty? You need time to set up? Okay. Good timing. Want the microphone? Okay, tonight we're here for a session. Uh, Let's just go item to item through the special permit requirements. This is a very small project that we're proposing here. Um, it's a 10,000 foot lot. Proposing one apartment in the office down below, and that's about it. Uh, in order even to do that to get parking and access, we're getting an easement from the property adjacent to the east, 38. Now, previously, we had started variances and architectural kind of design review board for a building that was twice this size. Um, issues came up with the ownership and how that was supposed to transpire. So now we're down to one building that's you know half you know half the size. Okay. Going through, I went through the uh, central permit requirements, and one of the ones, the first one is uh, you're, you're intended to ensure that this uh, growth rate, that the historic growth rate of the town, uh, it remains at 1%. Well, we're barely doubling, we're not even doubling the size of the building that's there, so I don't really see, once again, it's a very small thing uh, that um, I'm not sure how that's dealt with. The plan of conservation and development specifically targets the transitional commercial areas adjacent to the village areas for mixed use. And several years ago, I came to this, uh, this, board, this uh, commission to do a zoning, a text amendment to allow us to have a, you know, a more abundant amount of houses and been reduced quite a bit because of some of the development, Brookhaven, some of the, you know, large developments. And this is obviously a very small uh, project. Um, one of the things we're supposed to look at is, does this proposal offer the least possible disruptions to existing neighborhood areas? Well, we're adjacent to uh, Route 1, which is a 150-foot wide right-of-way, and the next house is 50 or 70 feet beyond that. That's the only residential property within eyesight and nearby to this site. Uh, the environment, you know, we're supposed to make not, not disrupt the, the environment. Well, the site's already built upon and we're going to leave ledge that's there. But that's really the only uh, natural feature. Um, the, one of the big issues in town, town-wide, that I'm sure you're all familiar with is the sewer moratorium. A decision was made by the Water Pollution Control Authority uh, to allow um, projects that had begun prior to the moratorium being instated uh, to proceed. 
And essentially what we're doing here is we're adding two, two, be two bedrooms, two baths, and a kitchen. So that's essentially a fairly small house. And the existing facility, the ground floor, uh, has the same uh, toilet room that the uh, proposed office will have. Um, in the expenditure plan, I have no idea uh, about that. Now, there are two sets of standards. There are the general standards for issuing a special permit, and then there are some specific one, ones for the residential mixed use. Uh, once again, some of the stuff is repetitive. This, the proposal is adequately served by water and sanitary, electricity, cable TV. It's all there. It's a well-established site. Uh, um, once again, the, the uh, public will be fully protected from fire, safety, security, the security equipment designed to eliminate hazards. We're building a building in 2021. Okay, but, you know, any kind of fire hazards or safety hazards and alarm systems uh, will have to be incorporated just to meet the code. The transportation services are adequate. Uh, this is a, this is essentially a kind of an odd street. It's one way to the right and two ways to the left. To the west, it's two. So there's really not. Um, a, you know, a tremendous, a, a tremendous amount of traffic generation. There'd be an office and one apartment. And the police commission has already looked at this, and I think it's in your notes um, to indicate that you know we've achieved what they're looking for. Um, dangerous, objectionable elements to area residents. Can't imagine you know what that would be. So I think we're we're clear on that. Um, no adverse impact on the character of the district. This is a real jumble of buildings. We have a fire station, two metal sheds that house the uh, oil, an oil company, a restaurant on one side, a vacant restaurant across the street, and then a newly um, converted building to allow four residential units to go directly across the street above a retail facility at Mr. Coastal Florin. So, so we've you know, gone through the Architectural Design Review Board, and I think they've but, you know, signed off that we've developed a building that uh, will not affect the character. Once again, uh, no deleterious impact to irretrievable environmental resources. This has been a developed site with grass, some very poor parking, and a building, and some ledge. That's about it. Um, all applicable state, federal, and local laws have been complied with, to the best of our knowledge. I mean, there's, you know, potentially something in the fire code or the building code, but we'll deal with that at that stage. And then something I mentioned earlier is consistent with the plan of conservation and development. This is something that um, after the uh, zoning, planning zoning commission uh, reduced the uh, residential capacity in the DC 60 zone, they looked at it and they said, well, you know, we really got to re revisit that and look at getting more residential in these mixed areas, the sort of village transitional transitional commercial areas is what this is what this is I and mean, between the restaurant next door you know being renovated and looking to be very you know uh, successful the mr coastal flooring now with some people there in the evenings with apartments and then potentially something across at the sailor eds you know i think this is sort of this poor stepchild of gc 60 zones and i think it's starting to you know make some inroads Okay, and there's a number of conditions you can make. I think they've been identified in staff report, so there's really nothing, you know, I can, we can go back to those. And I think Art Hayward's works here also. I'm, I'm in trouble, so I can, I'm not to miss I don't know, I didn't sign in, so. Um, and then there's a second set of um, additional uh, standards for a special permit to allow housing in a residential mixed use zone. Uh, minimum lot area, 5,000 is required. Well, we're twice that. Uh, residential density is one for 5,000 square feet. Once again, we're twice that, so we have one per 10,000. Um, and then there's a requirement when they, originally when the Planning and Planning Commission um, reduced the amount of residential uh, build-out in, in, in the GC60 zone, it was quite extraordinary. You know, it was like on the uh, 90,000 acre across the street, we could get a, two residential units in. After the zoning amendment we got, we have four there, which is, you know, uh, there's an additional expansion area there. There's a requirement that at least a third of the, of the uh, property remain commercial. It's 50-50 here. It's basically the first floor and second floor uh, footprint are the same. Uh, parking, um, we have the required amount of spaces. We have one extra. There's a range there. Um, we have nine spaces, two of which we have a sign on the building indicated they are strictly for residential use. 
Uh, yeah, and there's, you know, the, in the next section, they talk about that residential and commer commercial uses are compatible. Um, you know, once again, we have an office downstairs in, in a, in a two-bedroom apartment upstairs. There's a restaurant next door. I think we're compatible with that. I'd say the fire station in the um, oil depot might be less compatible to the, what we're doing, but they're pre-existing. And then once again, this is sort of the character of the neighborhood. We're, are we conforming with the urban design features of the surrounding area? Uh, they're pretty they're pretty dispersed. I mean, I'm not sure what you could define as that. And we also were carrying on that tradition or that character of the surrounding area once again. I have no idea. So those those are the, the things that you know we need. I, you know, I think you know you need to confirm that we've achieved the special permit. And with that. I guess I could ask questions, and then Art is here to talk about the site plan. If you have any questions on um, the specifics of that, any questions so far? What's the total square footage of the existing building? It's I don't know. Two thousand five hundred square feet. And what's the square footage of the proposed building? 2970, I think. Uh, right, so 3,000 versus the previous number. And actually, the way the, you know, that's that's the bulk of the building. The way the floor area is measured, the stairways don't count, and, you know, certain things don't count. The, um, the uh, go ahead. No, we were at one point one donor, two trusts, and the beneficiaries under one of the trusts um, had rights that we that we found out about after we'd already proceeded the previous process, and it was going to uh, challenge Mr. Densmore's uh, plan for uh, a revenue stream. Mm -hmm. So the siding of the building is using yeah, no, it's, it, I mean, I can't. A variance was granted this past week on the 12th by the uh, DBA for a 40 foot front yard set that was reduced to 20 feet. The it was actually the same exact variance set that was approved for the previous application when the lots were being merged. And that setback is not open. Correct. Thank you. You set. The, the site plan shows the driveway on the property next door. That's correct. And uh, I'm wondering how, in the long run, we ensure that that the property, the subject property, continues to have access to that. Right. There'll be there'll be cross easements. What's happening here is we basically have developed schematics to allow us to build another building similar to the one we're building right now on the other side of the driveway. We're not presenting that right now and that may probably will never happen. But the idea is that, you know, there would be cross easements to each uh, of 26 and 38 to allow them to share the driveway essentially. The properties at some point in the future could be owned by different people. Right. An easement would, it would survive that transfer title. So, so that the, the right to use that uh, 24 foot access has to go with this piece of property in perpetuity, does it not? That's yeah, that's the way an easement works, actually. Yeah, you don't you don't set a time limit on an easement or a right away. And then the near, I mean, the, in terms of what's very likely to happen there, if this property, either one of the properties were to sell, they probably sell as a combined uh, property. <laughs> but once again, it doesn't matter if we have an easement to allow cross, you know, cross access. Right. Uh, uh, it, yeah, that, that's good. But counting on what's likely to happen, <laughs> uh, I just want to make sure that 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 we don't end up at some future date with this property being owned separately and and having to reconfigure this whole parking and access. Sure, I get that. Yeah. that's understandable. Um, 
you know, I, we could have the town attorney review the easement to make sure that didn't happen, or you know, I mean, I, I don't know that the easement's going to be drafted at this point. I, not the specific language. I'm out of the Not from the specific language, but it's incorporated into the site plan. Uh, the legal description for both easements become part of the record, uh, and I have shown them. They're just just below the uh, table chart for the zoning table chart. I incorporated that because it becomes part of. Uh, so, so both both properties reflect that easement. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Just a few questions for Mr. Trump. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I looked at the town engineer's comments, and he's asking for test holes and a design of the drainage, and it appears as though that's all now completed. It was completed. It was completed and submitted to him by the uh, filing deadline, uh, which was I got the comments on Friday. I, the deadline was on Monday. I did those all the changes? He just did it with a wide new report. Okay. Yes. So the test holes actually were completed, and the design is based on the test holes. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, is there any plan to light the parking lot? Yeah, we have a lighting plan. I'm not sure you should have it uh, in the landscape package. I'm, I'm just curious what a wall pack like is. I'm sorry? Yeah, building um, I'm sorry, I didn't see it. I didn't see yeah, it's basically a pole light out of the route one side and then a bollard out with a little patio for the tenants and then a wall pack. Okay, thank you. Um, that, that's my question. Was there that's it. Oh, I do have one other question. I'm sorry. Uh, there's no compensatory storage required in the, in the floodplain zone here. Right. I know you're a student of, this, of the uh, regulations, so I'd just like to get on the record why, in this case, there's no compensatory excavation required to fill what's going to be done. Because the, the flood zone is tidal influence. If you're in the northern part of the uh, town, like Hopsbrook, where I own some land, that is it. That's, uh, if I were to fill in the flood zone, I have to have compensatory bone, but that's not the case. Uh, because it's tight, right? I just want that on the record because it isn't the case everywhere, and compensatory storage is required almost everywhere. Else. Thank you, sir. With respect to the drainage, just so uh, it's clear, the Stonington requires uh, a one-inch uh, retainage of, uh, of all stormwater from uh, impervious areas. This property, uh, the drainage far exceeds the one-inch uh, compensatory storage. We've analyzed the drainage on a 10-year, 25-year, 50-year, and 100-year. Uh, we have more than that, but uh, including the roof frames. Everything goes into that, into that subsurface stream. Uh, a little overkill, but it's it's better. There's no drain on uh, all stone to So that's why we took that one. Speaking of roof drains, I don't see them depicted anywhere. Um, elevations or I haven't, we haven't done that detail, but they, they're going to. I mean, the drainage, uh, uh, usually I leave that up to the the architect is the one who's doing the, the, the uh, roof drain part. Uh, the drainage is there. Uh, or where you can to those drainage uh, They will be tied into the subsurface drainage. Will they be in the final plans? They will. Thank you. Any good questions? Um, I just wondered about the signage. I'm looking at the schematic. So the only sign signage is on the north side of the building, correct? There's a freestanding sign on Route 1. Um, you look at the plan, it's just to the uh, left of where the driveway comes in. Close to the pole light on the site plan. Okay. 
And is that uh, that signage within the? Uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's within the uh, sizes and at such time that we have the actual text. I guess we come, we need to get a signing permit or something like that. Really signing this process. But that will be that will be confirmed. In the architectural set, I believe on the uh, one of the sheets that actually shows the signs. I think yeah. it gives the uh, dimensions. It's not the front. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let's have questions. Or... I do. Um, on the exterior lights, again, the wall pack will be full cut off, rusty. Yeah. So yeah, it'll it'll cover. Uh, yeah, it'll be uh, yeah, it'll cut. It won't be full cut off in terms of the property line, but it'll cover part of the, the uh, driveway next to it. Okay. And then I was confused. Is there an on-site well? Not that we could find. We could not find. Okay. It. So is that could be wiped off the map? Or? So you're using town water. Yeah. You know, we can't find that either. I mean, we uh, they <laughs> get water. we are supposed uh, to. <laughs> <laughs> The, the question was, is, is it's a well that has to be the, this, uh, this building, because I haven't seen it, and I've been there multiple times. And I called the sewer department, and they said, oh, no, you're on a well over there. So, so it's kind of okay. And I am assuming this is on a slab. It's not on somewhere. There's no basement. There is no, there's no basement. Okay. And lastly, there's, I'm quite familiar with this building, but there's no Two very handsome oak trees there. Are those being left alone? Yeah. Um, I think I saw on the site plan they were staying. Oh, they are. Okay, they're to the east. Okay. Right. Right. And there's no dumpster. There's garbage cans in that. But there's still it's still in an enclosure. Yeah. Okay. Just double check there was because there was some pictures. And you think you've met all the town's twenty two questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. <laughs> Chairman, I have one other point that I want to make about it. Please. It is it is stipulated in, in the comments that uh, the planning department sent to us in its general plan of report. But there is there is still a moratorium on connection to the sewer. And that moratorium will be a condition of, of this application. Town is engaged in a very active program to find capacity uh, that currently is being used by, by clean water entering the system through a variety of different forms. Uh, and we're confident that we can find that. But there will be a connection uh, stipulation in this application. And, uh, and you will have to apply to the sewer commission the capacity will or not the sewer commission, the WPCA to connect to the sewer and its contingent on capacity of the building. For the record, uh, in Palmer, uh, Water Pollution Control Authority issued a letter after a meeting on Monday, September 21st, 2021. The WPCA board voted to allow 50,000 gallons per day of additional wastewater flows to enter the Mystic Sewer System. This is a selective amount of additional flow to be allocated for projects already approved and not a lifting of the sewer moratorium. Since your project was approved, if they're going off of the original application, the one that was approved when the lots were being merged. Since your project was approved and you are currently on our waiting list, you will be allowed to connect to the Mystic Sewer System. Please bring this letter to the WPCA offices on the third floor of the town hall when you're ready to either apply for a building permit or a sewer permit. Okay, so that's one prior approval. It works for this one also. Okay, fine. Yeah. Disregard what I just said. You're in a very fortuitous position to have been approved. And it's interesting because I'm reading on page 20 of the planning department's report, and it says that, that this is subject to the moratorium. So I, I'm pleased that that's not the case. And, uh, and uh, 
we want to make sure that that's correct in, in the report so nobody thinks this is subject to the So, uh, so thank you. I just um, just for personal clarification, this has been approved. I mean, it was approved when the lots were being merged, right? So, right. because it's a separate lot, it's a separate application. Just they had to go back and get a, a whole new variance for the same reason. It's, it's so, what exactly? So it, it seems to me that everything that was approved was approved on the contingency that the lots were merged. Blacks were not merged, so that approval is no longer valid. So, yeah, I, I don't see how this is, I'm sorry, I'm just, I don't see how this was pre-approved. What, what we did was, and I'll, I'll, I'll answer this question for you, because uh, I was at the WPCA meeting, mm -hmm. um, and I was not aware, again, because of the comment that's in the report, it appeared as though this were going to be approved subject to the new moratorium. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, but, but we did specifically state that any projects that had been approved subject to the first moratorium, they fell within a list of projects. This must have been on that list. Yes. That's why our, uh, that's why Doug Middleton issued the letter to those projects that were on the list. We knew what the capacity was that they required, and we actually have that capacity. So we allowed those projects to move forward. However, everything from this point forward, which I thought this project fell into, and you probably did as well, mm -hmm. uh, everything from this point forward will be subject to a sewer moratorium again until we find the source of a lot of clean water that's getting into the system that is using up capacity that the town actually thought they had and don't. So mm -hmm. it's a fairly simple process. Uh, you know, uh, cite an example, uh, there's an article in today's paper about the city of New Britain. And the city of New Britain had the same problem, they have an old system, there's a lot of infiltration, a lot of clean water getting into the system, using up the capacity of the system. The city did a study, I and I study, just like we're doing here, and they found that 41% of the water in the system was clean water. And they reduced the flow by that amount through, uh, you know, this I and I study, and, and that's what we've got to do here. So we're in the process of doing it. Even the new projects that get approved, I'm, I'm encouraged that we can find the capacity, but we have to put that moratorium on new projects. This would not be one. Thank you for my so, so what you're saying is that all the projects that we have approved to date that have been subject to the moratorium are now free to move ahead? Roger. So, I can do for it instance, tomorrow, the one of four stuff. units across the yeah, street. No problem. You could have a list of okay, so we'll be very handy. That's correct. Okay. So uh, be a lot that of, that, a lot is, that is the situation, and um, hopefully we'll be in a situation where where we find you know a lot of low hanging fruit uh, like roof drains, yard drains, catch basins, and parking lots. That are the source of massive amounts of inflow uh, that is clean water that shouldn't be going to the right. Thank you. Are there any more questions for these discussions? Are there any comments in favor of this application? Are there any opposition to this application? Any discussion on this side? Want to close it? Want to close the hearing? Yeah, I would move to close the hearing. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Um, so we have two votes. We have the CAM and the special use permit. That's the three, Mr. Chairman. That's the waiver. Excuse me, the waivers. I missed my own votes. Yes, let's do the waivers first. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I move the waivers requested by the applicant, which are stipulated on page 18 of the planning department's report, uh, be approved. Second. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. But oh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, I skipped over a staff report. If you had more input put into a. No, I did not. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> Gave you a chance. <laughs> I zoomed right over you. That's what it's for. You've been thinking okay. for that one. Back, we have a motion about the waivers. It's been seconded, I believe. All yes. those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.
Next would be the CAM. Chairman, I move approval of the uh, CAM application on this property. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. Chairman, I move approval of the special permit application as submitted by the applicant for this property. Second. I would just like to um, talk about that. So, our work, and to your point, I was getting to the, the, the two lots, et cetera. Are there any, anything that we can see being modeled there? And that you know, there, there is no part of it the arrival of nothing would be building on the lot if the if the easement is recorded in both on both property records should not be a problem shouldn't that binds all successors and signs as well so so an easement for a particular purpose whether it's for a utility or whether it's for a driveway is is a perpetual right and it can't be extinguished uh, in a sale you have to be careful when you sell the property, but you also sell the easement. Mm -hmm. But but you know that's the reason you hire attorneys at a closing to make sure that those things happen. The applicant in this case has submitted a description of the easement. It's on the site plan, uh, right below the dwelling table, uh, and and it fully describes the easement in a mets and bounds description. So it goes all around the easement. So it is it's a good question because common driveways are a common problem. But it's usually because there's no reason for it in this case. In this case, for it. Um, I do want to amend my my motion though, to include the conditions that are recommended in the uh, planning report. Those are the stipulations of, of the town engineer and various other agencies. So I'm I'm including the stipulations that are included in the planning report. Is it one through five? Yes. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So carried. Thank you, gentlemen. Rules one more time. Everybody's familiar with them. Uh, I think I'm all set. Uh, for the record, I suppose one more time is Chuck Sheehan, Craig Dykeman, myself, Ben Kubrick, Lynn Conway, and Ryan DZ are in charge. Now it's all yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Uh, for the record, my name is Bill Sweeney. I'm a land use attorney and a partner at the law firm of Tobin Carberry in London, Connecticut. Uh, joining me tonight is uh, Aaron Lapley. Aaron is the owner of uh, Full Beast LLC. Uh, he owns it with his uh, partner, uh, business partner, uh, uh, James uh, Wardwell, as well. Uh, we have an application uh, pending before this commission tonight for a special permit to, to add full liquor service to an existing restaurant in Mystic, Grass and Bone, which I think you're all familiar with. It's located at 24 East Main Street. Uh, this is an LS5 zone property. Um, some of you may have been on the commission uh, several years ago when I came in with Whole Beast, when it was primarily owned by Dan Miser, who, uh, who operates Engine Room and Oyster Club in Mystic. Uh, Dan is no longer involved in, with Whole Beast, um, and Aaron and James are the new operators of the business. Um, this commission granted a special permit at that time for wine and beer service only uh, with the restaurant. Um, Dan's moved on, as I said, uh, but Aaron and James um, Aaron and James uh, now own, uh, operate the business. They are committed to maintaining the same high-quality restaurant 
uh, the same quality food experience that um, I think Mystic uh, uh, frequent uh, people who frequent Mystic have, have come to know and love. Um, but they're going to make it their own restaurant as well with their own twist. Uh, it'll be probably a bit more upscale, a little bit more on uh, fine dining rather than takeout. Um, but we're going to see how that goes in the, in the com next coming months. Um, proposal before you though uh, makes no changes to uh, the restaurant itself. There's no changes in seating. We originally approved for 52 seats. We have a little bit less than that inside right now because of COVID, just to create a little bit more separation. Um, our number of employees at the Creative Shift, five, has, is not changing with our, our proposal. Our hours of operation, which are 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. daily and 9 p.m. on Saturdays, that's not changing either. Um, we're not changing the interior layout of the premise at all. There's no exterior changes to the building, no site work, no changing no changes to the on-site parking. We're not adding a consumer bar. Um, we're not proposing any amplified live entertainment. Um, bottom line is we have no changes whatsoever, except when you go to Grass and Bone and you order a meal, you can choose not only a beer or a wine, but you can have a cocktail. And that's the only reason we're here tonight. That's the only thing that's before uh, the board. Uh, as you know, there's dozens of full service restaurants with liquor, um, restaurant permits in the greater Mystic area. Uh, our setup particularly as a small place with very limited hours and we close literally at 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. at night uh, certainly does not encourage a late night bar scene, um, which I know some uh, people have concerns with with adjacent neighbors. Um, the police commission has reviewed our application uh, and they were very pleased to see that we're not expanding the hours, that we're keeping the nature of the business the same. Uh, and so they uh, endorsed our, our plan last week. Um, we have requested waivers of the typical uh, site plan requirements because there are no changes to our site whatsoever uh, and, all, and waivers of many of the special permit requirements because this is an unusual application. It's just basically adding the ability to have mixed drinks in the facility. Um, certainly we don't believe that there is any impact to infrastructure, any impact to public safety. Our uh, transportation uh, network is adequate no impact to the neighborhood. Uh, it's certainly consistent with laws and regulations. We will need to go to the State Liquor Commission to modify our restaurant permit, which we currently have. And we think it's consistent with the plan of conservation and development, which is to, which urges us to support existing small businesses in the greater Mystic area. Um, and Grass and Bowen has become part of the fabric of downtown Mystic. Uh, and with Aaron and James now at the wheel, um, certainly we look forward to having them continue their success. Um, that is it for my presentation tonight. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Any questions? So no no um, dedicated space for a bar? No. It wasn't in the original application, and there's no, none in this application. Um, all uh, beverages, whether alcoholic or non-alcoholic, are served from a, a service station with right. waiters, and um, that's just not the scene that we're trying to create um, okay. in the facility. If in the future we decide we want that, we would have to come back the reason being is our initial special permit for the um, facility actually has a condition, no consumer bar. So, and that holds even with this request for modification. If, we, if the business plan calls for that in the future, we'll need to come back before you. Uh, you can't pull up a bar stool and have a good dedicated bar. Yeah, we don't have a bar. And that's an important question. Remember, um, there is the zoning aspect here, but there's also the state liquor control. You have to basically identify consumer bars in your state liquor permit. So if we're approved tonight, tomorrow morning, I'll be pulling out the on-premise liquor application and start filling it out uh, for Candy's uh, signature. So um, I think it's a very straightforward application for good local business with new owners and um, certainly want to wish them the best of success. Any comments from the public or against? Stipulations of original approval shall apply. Uh, 
So, um, let me ask a question. So that was the original stipulation. And if we went ahead and approved this, and then six months later, they decided to put a consumer bar, what is, and say, well, we already have bar. We already, you know, it's no impact to the, on the neighborhood because we're in the zone. Um, what, what are our grounds that, uh, to, to the enforcement it? officer would be <laughs> they, would, they would require a building permit. To get a building permit, they need a zoning permit. When the zoning permit comes in, comes in, I realize, oh no, this is in violation of your special use permit. You need to apply for a new special use permit. Mm -hmm. And it's come before us again. Right. Yeah. Right. Correct? Correct. I guess. All right, all right. Motion to approve the waivers. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Motion to approve the special use permit with a stipulation. Second. And this is the stipulation is that you know, the, the, the yes. conditions of the prior approval apply. All, right. okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay. So ordered. Yep. All righty. Is that the point of my vote? Yes. Yes. Okay. Our final application for not tonight is PC two one two eight SUP uh, Garbarino and Garbarino B four Enterprises LLC special use permit application for wine and beer on premises and for sale of permit for existing Nana's pizzeria and bakery retail restaurant property located at 32 Williams Avenue, Mystic Assessors Map 161, Block 16, Block 2, Zone LS5. Um, so, see you this evening. Check the I think myself and Philbert, Lynn Conway, and Ryan Deasy. Um, we'll have the applicant, comments, discussion, rebuttal, <clears throat> closing, and a vote. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I try not to make it too much like deja vu, but um, for the record, my name is Bill Sweeney. I'm a land use attorney and a partner at the law firm of Coke Carver in London, Connecticut. I'm here tonight on behalf of Whole Beast LLC, which is my client. Aaron Lately is here. He's one of the principals of the company. Um, Whole Beast operates more than one restaurant. Uh, in the greater Mystic area, and they also operate uh, Nana's Pizzeria and Bakery. And as I said before, there's been a recent change in ownership, uh, include, and that includes for Nana's as well. Um, their operation is behind Sea Squirrel on 32 Williams Avenue. Uh, it is located also in an LS5 zone. Uh, we've applied for a special bur permit to add restaurant beer and wine only sales. There is no liquor for permit on the premises right now. Um, they'd like to be able to serve beer and wine uh, to their customers. Very similar to the last application before you. Um, we're not making any changes to seating, um, the interior uh, layout, employees, the hours of operations, which I would put for the record, this is all in my application, is 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, we are not making any um, changes. As I said, to the interior layout, there is no consumer bar. Um, there is no exterior or site work associated with the application. We're not proposing any amplified live entertainment. Uh, again, what we're doing is so if you get a piece of pizza, you now have the choice of being able to have a beer or a glass of wine with it. Um, we don't think that that will have any impact whatsoever to the surrounding neighborhood. It's wholly consistent with the restaurant uses that are all over um, uh, Mystic, and quite frankly, it's much less than some of the other ones. Um, our police commission has reviewed this application as well uh, last week and forwarded a favorable recommendation. 
we have requested waiver of site plan and other special permit requirements similar to the last application. Um, and again, we don't believe, for the record, we don't believe there's any impact to infrastructure, public safety, uh, the transportation network is adequate. Um, there's no, like I said, no impact to the surrounding neighborhood. It's consistent with state law on liquor, and it supports, again, another small and established local business by just giving them a little bit of more flexibility in their sales. Um, this is obviously a much smaller operation than Grass and Bone, uh, but uh, my client feels that as they begin to take over these businesses, this would give them a little bit more flexibility going forward. So uh, with that, uh, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. The, the, big, the big difference between Nano's and Grass and Bone is that Nano's has essentially no indoor seating. It has eight seats inside. Correct. Eight? Eight. Right. It's no. allowed eight as a retail restaurant. Okay, I counted three today, but <laughs> it, if you say it's eight, it's eight. Uh, it's, 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 it's mostly takeout, as Absolutely. opposed to yeah, without a doubt, as opposed to um, uh, grass and bone, which is most, which is virtually all, I guess, sit down dining. I guess you can do some takeout. Yeah, so I see a huge difference. I don't know why why we would want a. Uh, a takeout restaurant to have a, any sort of a liquor permit. You can get a slice of pizza and a beer and, and get in your car and drive down Route 1. I, you know, it's asking for trouble, I think. But you can't do that. I mean, you, you can't serve that alcohol. There was a period of time during COVID you could do things, but you can't do that. Under state law, restaurants with restaurant liquor permits require on-premise consumption. And so you have to actually have it on premise. You can't take it and leave. The only ex exception to that is if you're serving full course meals and you get a bottle of wine, you can cork your bottle of wine and take it with you like any other restaurant. But you can't, for instance, go up to a counter and say, I want a six pack of beer and a, and a large pizza. That's not allowed under Connecticut state law. So it never happens. <laughs> okay. I, 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 never mind. I, I just think I. I think that, you know, I represent a lot of clients before the Liquor Commission. I, it's a couple areas of my practice. And if you did that, that is that is a great way to get your license not only suspended, but revoked really quickly. You just can't do that at all. Um, there are very strict um, delineations between on-premise consumption and off-premise. Off-premise being things like um, package stores, for example, or supermarkets, and on-premise being like restaurants and cafes. Um, totally different permit classes, and you start mixing those two, um, you're not only going to be up in Hartford in front of the, the three liquor commissioners, you're going to lose the permit. So um, on-premises would include the picnic tables and so on and so forth out and around the... Zone. Perhaps. We'd have to get state approval for those picnic tables, and, and that could be difficult, quite frankly. Again, as I said before, you have to have approval from both the local municipality and the state to be able to serve liquor. So. The property at 32 Williams has um, picnic tables out toward the water, which you can buy an ice cream cone at Sea Squirrel and go and sit at them. Um, typically, the state requires you to have defined control over an outdoor patio area. That outdoor patio area should be signed, and it also needs to be segregated. Uh, right now, it's not, so that can't be used as a patio in its, in its current location. So, so let me, and, yeah, let me ask a question. Yeah. So then you wouldn't be able to take the beer out there. You'd have to have not a, not as set up right now. Not as, okay. Let's do you envision trying to get that accomplished? We would have to negotiate with the landlord to do that because it's not set up like that right now. Those are general open for anybody on the property. Yeah, would well, you have to come back in front of us? I get the would, right. That would yeah. have to be on the site plan. And you'd have to delay it. Correct. Yeah. Or the design permit would be denied and you'd be sent back there. So, just to be clear tonight, this is just an indoor service only. That's the only thing that's in our application. And okay. again, I'm not even sure that that's even possible on that property because you have to have a defined area that's actually segregated. You can't have people from Sea Swirl bring in ice cream cone into your liquor patio. It's not allowed by state law. Could we actually even stipulate that? Make it a stipulation that it would only be for indoor. Express it clear. I think your application state is. Is the application state just indoor? That's the only thing that's in my application right it's, now. It's indoor only. Yeah. So if you put a stipulation this time, no outdoor. Yeah. Sure. And, 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 if, and, if, and if it's sometime in the future we're able to get that from the, from the landlord, we can come back and show you what it is. But it would have to be different than it is now. I couldn't go to the state the way it's laid out right now. Okay. 
So how long has Nianna been open? It's been a full year. And that's Aaron, for the record, that's Aaron. Okay. okay. And although you're only doing eight seats inside, you currently have how many? Three? Four. Four seats. And what percentage of your business is uh, taken out? Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, percentage? Right now, of takeout, I would say is about 45 percent is takeout. And is that uh, the breakfast takeout or the? That, that's the that's the entire business. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Uh -huh. There, if you've driven by, you'll see a lot of people eating breakfast outside mm -hmm. during the daytime. Mm -hmm. so, so, okay, go ahead. Um, so it's been established for a year. There's currently four seats. And um, almost half of your business is taken out. Right. I would just like to correct something on the record. While there may be four seats today, the proposed floor plan we show, we're not changing anything inside, but there are eight seats shown on the floor plan that we submitted with our application. Yeah. But what you have established today is four seats. And what you have established for the last is four seats. That's correct. We're allowed to have up to eight hundred. Yeah. So, do you have servers? On yeah, uh, we have like a cashier, fast casual. No, I meant a, like a waitress, waiter, wait person. If, if we were to have, serve alcohol, yes, we would have them all tip certified as normal servers in the state would be. Mm -hmm. And so, then they would be making these drinks, uh, pouring beer and bringing out the drink. So, so they would be the ones responsible for controlling exactly. controlling that it be controlling inside the rather than out. Anything leaving? Yes. Any other questions? Staff report? Okay. Nothing further. Any motion for it? Someone wants to sign all those in favor? Aye. 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 Discussion? Mm. Yeah. Really? <laughs> Should the commission choose to approve that they do offer up one stipulation, no outdoor consumption of alcohol uh, without further approval from the state? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. You're right. No, I did skip over that. Um, we we'll reopen, reopen the public hearing. Please reopen. Public hearing, we reopen. Sorry, Carlene. Uh, for the record, my name is Carlene Don Um The attorney, the attorney said that they, the application was for inside only. When I read it, it says on premise. Premises to me means the whole property. So I think there's a question here about whether or not we have a liquor sale. Maybe the stipulation that's being proposed by staff would cover that. Um, I just I think we need some time. Good point. Thank you. This is a leased property. We don't own the only full property, so the premises is in the internal area. And as I said before, uh, in part of my testimony, the outdoor seating is not part of the premise. It's shared among the other tenants as well, so it's not part of the premise. And in under Connecticut liquor law as well, the premises is defined as the indoor area of a restaurant or cafe. So I just want to make that clear on the record. Thank you. Uh, uh, Councilor? Does that mean, I know Grass and Bone has an outdoor area. Does that mean they don't serve liquor out there? They have an outdoor, they have an outdoor area under Governor Lamont's COVID order, which supersedes Connecticut liquor law uh -huh. and Connecticut zoning so that's law. A, that's that a temporary. That is what we call a COVID patio, which um, okay. I do a lot of work in other towns. COVID patios are going to be a major issue come March. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and okay. there's a lot of talk. You know about keeping COVID patios 
having another executive order extending them, but they're never going. They're not going to be extended forever, and so it's it is challenging because it's not just whole beast, but I have a number of clients in a number of towns that have modified their business model to include COVID patios, which might be taken away next spring. And how do you deal with that? And so I, you know, I would urge the commission to think about that. Uh, I know, I know, for instance, in London and Norwich and in Ledger, they're already looking at that as what are we going to do with our businesses when that ends? But to answer your question, uh, that is a COVID patio. Got it. Thank you. I think I think I'm gonna I'm gonna take vacation next March. Second. All those in favor. Aye. Mr. Chairman, I move we approve the 14 waivers uh, submitted by the applicant. Applicant and then stipulated on page 32 of the planning report. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Mr. Chairman, I move uh, approval of uh, the application on the property uh, subject to the stipulation uh, that, um, if you could just repeat that, uh, Candy, please. I want to make sure we get the line correct. No outdoor consumption of alcohol without further approval from this commission. Subject to the condition as, as just ratified, uh, staff. Second. So I I just think that um, uh, I don't think that this property, this business, has been established. Um, that this wouldn't be kind of an expansion. Um, sure, it might be not be a physical expansion, etc. But I, I'm not sure that you know a three C, four C, you know, with the majority being takeout, etc. I don't, I don't think that we can say this is an established, uh, you know, business of this nature. Um, and I, I think that this should. Be I think they have been staffing. I don't, you know, it's not established. They don't have, you know, a week staff. They have a cashier. Um, it's, it's just outside the scope of what has been established for this. Yeah, my, my concern is similar. I think controlling the dispensing of liquor in, in that particular environment is going to be very problematic. And, and I don't. I think maybe we ought to see that the, you know, that the property is more uh, well defined and, and and separate from you know, the uh, ice cream operation and the gas station, whatever else is there, right, right around it. It's, it right now, I mean, you, you could fit the whole thing in less space than this table takes up, and. and can't imagine. Can't imagine a, a twenty-year-old Greek person having the authority to say, "You can have your beer, but you have to drink it inside. You can't take it out to the picnic tables." I, I just think it's asking for trouble. Um, so I, I, I would be inclined to to vote against the application. So. In addition, there's nothing. Donuts, food. Is there a car? Yeah, pizza place now. Yeah. Well, it's not there yet. Yeah. So, Tim, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I don't deny that, that there's, you know, in a premise that's this small, that there isn't a control drive. <laughs> Well, I think, I think okay. there is one, but but I think if that issue exists, it exists in any establishment. Anybody can try to walk out with a drink. You know, I, I know it's illegal and I would never do it, but, but uh, you know, I don't see why we would discriminate against a place that is just based on its size. Uh, this this is the business model that says that they want to operate the way that most pizza places operate. Most of them have beer and wine permits, and if they can live within the 
uh, the confines of the of the laws of the state of Connecticut, they can keep their license. If they can't, they're going to lose it. But I, I don't think I don't think there's any more of a challenge here, and I and I don't think we should discriminate based on the size of, of the establishment or how long it has been in place. Because if they had asked for this in the beginning, we probably would have given it to them when they when they first opened. So yeah. I, I I I don't I, I think it's prejudicial to, to you know say that because of its size uh, or or how long it's been there. Um, we, we don't want to. We don't want to approve this application. I certainly respect the right of anybody to vote any way they want. But I'm going to vote in favor of the application uh, because I think with the stipulation that we place um, and the liquor laws in the state of Connecticut, and the excellent presentation that Attorney Sweeney gave us here tonight, I think we're we'll protected. That, it's not size. It's more the character of the operation. It's more the, the fact that it's. Is that there is such extremely limited indoor controllable seating that it, it seems to me that it's going to be very, very difficult to make that work. I don't disagree. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, so, so passing it on to the State Liquor Commission is something we could do, I guess. But, but then, uh, I'm not sure why we would want to do that. Well, yeah, if I may, I, I, I agree with, with Chuck. I think it's discriminatory, first of all, to say, well, it's only been in existence for a year, so that's going to be held against them, and we won't approve something like this. I think it's also the stipulation that we've made. We've done everything we can to say, okay, you know, we have the concerns, and we're making that very clear that you follow these guidelines to stay within the bounds. Everything else, it's legal, and, and a lot of the other businesses around those kind of businesses have those same kind of challenges, if you will, keeping people from going outside and then coming inside. Right? And that's up to them to manage that and, and to adhere to it. Okay, but the, the fact that the outside isn't defined I to agree, them is, we're, a, we're is an issue. It, we're defining it with them, you know, what we need approval is, we're defining it by saying you can only do it inside expressly. Outside. And I realize, and I understand, you think, okay, how's that going to be controlled? But I think that's something that any business would have to have to, you know, do with. You know, they advertise themselves as a bakery, as a bakery and a pizzeria. I just uh, we didn't ask the breakdown of their business, etc. But you know, I just think it's it's not. It's not advisable to give a you know a wine and beer liquor license to this establishment. I just it's basic. Yeah, I disagree. But I understand the position. Okay, vote. We'll go one by one. Chuck. Aye. 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 Thank you. Maybe I think we have another network that probably comes to You know, good. People just ignore the roots. Yeah. You know, um, but you know, know it's quite fun. Um, anyway. Score yet. <laughs> Closing no, the hearing? No score yet. Yeah, no, text yet. <laughs> no, no score. Yeah. I think it's, we still have to uh, item nine, the new submittal schedule for uh, uh, November 16th. Uh, you don't, you you don't, don't do that here? Time. Okay. <laughs> All right, then the November 3rd meeting has uh, been pushed from a Tuesday to a Wednesday. And I don't believe we have any item action items on it. 
So uh, the commission needs to uh, deliberate on perhaps uh, canceling that meeting. I was going to recommend we cancel the November 3rd meeting. Second. Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Now, Close the meeting. Motion to close. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.